Brandon, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, number one, I got to say, I am such a fan of what you're doing. Uh, you, I think, have brought a lot of moral clarity to a lot of the questions people are having right now about politics, and particularly the the narrative that's going out there about President Trump and about the Democrat Democratic Party. Now, I grew up as in New England, I was a liberal most of my life. Uh, even going into the military, I was a liberal. And I, I, I voted for the Democratic Party because I believed in things like tolerance and, and equality and, and social justice and things like that. But in the time six, since 2016, a lot of questions have arisen. Uh, and, and I personally have made a complete transformation just, just as you have. And, um, you know, I, w I want to get into your story behind this walk away movement that you started. I want to get into your story. Well, now absolutely. You got me absolutely. <laughs> Can I interview you? Yeah. <laughs> now you got me intrigued. Well, what happened? Tell me. <laughs> Sorry, well, let me ahead. tell you something because I, okay. I, I joined the Marine Corps at 19 years old, right? And, okay. and like I said, I grew up in New England. I grew up uh, with, with a lot of what you would consider liberal ideals. Right. And, and, uh, after the Marine Corps, I went to graduate school and I did the whole social science PhD thing. I was in a PhD program for political science, uh, up at UC Santa Barbara for a while. And, uh, what happened to me was around two or three years ago, I started noticing a lot of, a lot of people within my academic circle, within my old academic circle, where it just seemed like you put a tweet up the other day about the Salem witch trials and mm -hmm. growing up in New England, that was a story that, that was ingrained in my DNA, like hearing about people who saw things in black and white, good and evil and things like that, that that was the wrong way to go. And I thought to myself, I never could have seen anything like that happening again. But what's going on with the left in this country right now. And, and I don't even want to say necessarily liberal ideology, but the leftist ideology that's taken over the Democratic Party, it's turned things into this completely irrational point of viewing things. And I see a lot of very fascist type behavior coming from the left. Um, and, and that is something that scares the crap out of me. And I, I, I believe it's something that scared the crap out of you as well, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm just so intrigued by your story. I want to just keep asking you questions. But yes, I, I did start to see that myself. Um, but I think that for me, it was a little more, uh, I got pushed a little too far, because um, I am a gay man. And, mm -hmm. you know, after Trump was elected, or even the time leading up to him, to the election, the narrative that the media kept perpetuating was that, uh, Trump and his followers are all bigots and racists and homophobes and that they want to roll people's rights back and they want to take us back to, uh, you know, a, a time of less equality and they kind of un unleash this new wave of hatred in America. And so I was really scared, like, as a gay man, mm -hmm. especially when Trump got elected, because, you know, the media kept saying all this, but they also kept saying, well, but he has like a less than 3% chance of winning. Right. So even though he's so terrible and his followers are so terrible, don't worry about it because they're such, a, you know, this is going to be the biggest landslide we've ever seen. And well, of course, that wasn't the result whatsoever. So that kind of threw me in this position of being like, OK, now not only do I have to contend with the fact that we have the second coming of Hitler in office, but like I don't even know who voted for him. You know, I'm like walking down the street and going, did you vote for him? Did you vote for him? Did you vote like where are all, like who are all these covert bigots amongst us who are nice to your face and, you know, smile at you and say good morning every day. And then secretly are hoping you get shoveled off in a concentration camp. And I mean, that's literally like the, what the media was kind of making it seem like. And so it scared the hell out of me. And that ultimately kind of led to me trying to research the truth about what was going on. And because I didn't want to be afraid. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to spend the next four years of my life that miserable and that afraid as I was feeling immediately after the election. But I do have a question for you, which is that, um, you know, I look at you and you appear to be a heterosexual white man, kind of the, mm -hmm. this, the, the stereotype of 
uh, you know, the, the, the norm in this country. Um, what was opening your eyes? What was it, you know, because it doesn't really sound like you had the fear, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, we're going to put straight white men in concentration camps if Trump gets elected. So what was it that you were like, this has gone too far. This isn't right. Well, I have to say that as, as somebody who's been in a PhD program in the social sciences, particularly in California, um, one of the things that in, in, let me preface that by saying being in the Marine Corps, almost everybody was a conservative, right? So mm -hmm. I, one of the big things that drew me toward the Democratic Party back then was the fact that I felt like we got into a needless war in Iraq. And I saw a lot of my friends die. I saw a lot of, of, of guys coming home in body bags that I thought shouldn't have been doing that. I thought the whole war made no sense to me. Um, and mm -hmm. so that was one of the things that drove me over toward that side. And then entering academia, that environment, if you are anything but a, a political liberal, if you are, even if you're on the liberal line and you're not completely leftist, you get alienated, you, you get intimidated, you get intimidated out of your academic freedom of thought, you get intimidated out of voicing your opinion. And back then I was so brainwashed for a while that I thought that anybody who thought as a conservative was a, a simple minded person. And I think that's a combination of things. Number one, it's, it's a, a, a bit of East Coast, West Coast snobbery. Because I think those of us in the cities, we look down on those in the middle, the flyover states, we call them. And then as an academic, it was a, a question of rationality. And I said, okay, um, if, if I even think like this, then that means I'm going down a road toward, um, toward simple-minded thinking. And it was just this kind of thing that ingrained in me. What changed for me was when I started noticing that number one, uh, people on the left were, were saying some extremely irrational things. Um, so when you talk about people sending white men off, white straight men off to concentration camps, I mean, yeah. some of the things people are saying on the left right now, they add up to that. They do. Um, and, right. and that might just be me as a white straight male saying that, but, but honestly, it's not too far off. Right. Um, and, and well, I I'm sorry. Go ahead. Number two, I, I, I mean, anybody who seemed to step out of line with the thinking, like yourself as a gay man, or I've seen other, other black thinkers who thought conservatively, uh, you know, what's happened to Kanye West? I mean, like, all of these different things are adding up to seeing a very intolerant um, portion of the United States uh, pushing this, this kind of leftist agenda that Trump is a Nazi, a bigot, a racist who's ruining the country. Right. Well, I, I guess I was curious if the uh, the rhetoric that seems to be acceptable now surrounding straight white men was a, a catalyst or a concern for you, because I, I would certainly think that it would be. I Honestly, I don't know how you guys do it um, because it's become so. <laughs> well, I mean, really, though, I mean, it's just become so normalized to bash straight white guys. And, um, and I see, you know, all you guys kind of just take it on the chin. I don't really see anyone acting out response to that, but I think it just shows like, uh, unbelievable restraint, uh, on behalf of, you know, a lot of you guys, because, um, I don't know that I would be so restrained. If, I mean, I am a white man, mm -hmm. uh, but I do usually get a little bit of a pass because I'm gay. Uh, although at this point they hate gay men just as much as they hate uh, straight men. Uh, I mean, it's, it, I, I've said before, I mean, the, the, it's not going to be long before they lop that letter G off the LGBT because they really only care. I mean, they really only care about these new, um, they're not even transgender. They say they're transgender, but it's like, you know, the non-binary, gender fluid, gender queer, gen what these like r absurd gender classes that are kind of under the umbrella of LGBT. But if you're a gay man, you are not wanted anymore under that LGBT umbrella because we are considered to be so privileged as gay men that we might as well be straight men. Uh, but 
<clears throat> but they don't really, we don't get the same kind of bashing these days that straight guys do, white, white straight guys do. What, what is it with this notion of privilege? Um, you know, this idea that if, regardless of how you were born, regardless, I mean, I grew up, I had a single mother, she worked three jobs. We were, we, we were on welfare for a lot of my childhood. We, we worked our way out of it. Um, but regardless, I am said to have privilege as a white straight male. What is, what is with this notion of privilege and why is it being weaponized like this? Well, okay. So my opinion on that is that it probably started off like most things from a good and sincere place. Um, or, or I don't know if good is the right word, uh, probably kind of like a necessary, uh, and real place. And then it's just become completely, as you say, weaponized and it's become, um, an obsession for a lot of people on the left and, and, and they, have misused it and mischaracterized it to a certain degree. I mean, and when I say a, a, you know, a necessary and kind of valid thing at one time, you know, I can remember during, you know, I, I'm, I'm in my forties. So I, you know, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties and uh, I experienced very real, very significant homophobia. I, I know exactly what that looks like. And I also can speak to the fact that, it doesn't exist anymore the way that it used to. I'm not saying it doesn't exist at all, but I mean, this homophobia today is very kind of rare and hard to find. And it's very watered down compared to what it was in the nineties or even the early two thousands. And, um, but I, you know, there was definitely a time of just this enormous hypocrisy when a lot of people who were blatantly anti-gay and we'll, we'll just use the gay thing, for example, it, it also pertains to racism or, sexism or, or, or whatever. But I mean, I can remember all too well that some of the most kind of strident voices uh, that were anti-gay were these people who were just total hypocrites. Because it's like the same people that would say, uh, you know, why do you have to talk about being gay? If you're just, you know, just be gay and shut up about it. Or, you know, why do you have to throw your lifestyle in my face? Those are always the people who are like, overtly talking about their sexual feelings for women and what they were going to do with women and you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, you're gr graphically and blatantly sexual all the time. I mean, I'm literally just saying I'm a gay man and you find that so offensive, but you're allowed to, to say whatever you want about your sexual desires for women and what you want to do. And you want to bang this one. And, but you know, and it's like, and so I think that it, it just, there was this period of time where it was very clear that if you were a part of the majority and the accepted norm, you kind of didn't necessarily have this sense of empathy about what it felt like to be a part of the minority and, and your own hypocrisy in that, like your own, it's like if the situation where the majority of people were in the minority of people were heterosexual, the same behavior that you engage in on a daily basis would not be accepted, but you don't realize this sort of privilege that you have because you just happen happen to have been born a member of the, the majority. And so I think that the, the notion of privilege started with this desire to kind of point out the hypocrisy to people that like, look, you know, you, you get triggered by someone just simply saying that they're gay. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, your behavior is actually so much worse in the way that you overtly talk about your sexuality and whatever. Um, so, you know, and I think it started out as a means to kind of point out people's hypocrisy and say, look, you know, you're, there's a double standard here that you're perpetuating, but now it has gone so overcorrected and to the point of weaponized that, you know, people are just like, well, you shouldn't even have an opinion about this as a straight white man. You're so, right. privileged. you know, it's, we've, we've overcorrected. It's gone way too far. And it's also being pointed now at people who don't even deserve it. You right. know, people who are like, like, look, I don't have a problem with gay people. I don't have a problem with black people. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter. You have white skin and you're, you know, so shut your mouth, you know, uh, and stop mansplaining. So, you know, well, it just become a, a joke. That's a big part of my fear because as, as I told you, uh, most of this audience is, is U.S. military combat veterans. And my fear is that, you know, that, that 22, 23 year old guy who's getting out of the military, been through a few combat tours, going to head to a university campus, try to build his future, but in the process be told in class that he's not supposed to have an opinion. He's not supposed to speak up. 
and he's actively supposed to just sit at the back of the room and shut up. And that's, that's some of the things that are being said right now out there on the university campuses. And my fear is that, you know, in, in, this didn't happen, you know, in the 90s either. I mean, like if you were on a university, I was on a university campus, um, you know, in the early 2000s and, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like we were saying all minorities sit in the back, shut up. But now it's, if you're a white straight male and you've followed these norms, then, then sit in the back of the room and shut up. So my fear is that, that there's going to be increased alienation, increased marginalization. And, you know, it, all of these things that people are saying about Trump and saying about the conservative movement, um, I fear that more extremes are going to come to pass because it's just right now a battle of extremes. No, there's definitely potential if they don't, you know, get, I think, a sense of self-awareness about themselves and their, their messaging and the, their, the way in which they're, they're talking to people and interacting with people. There's definitely a potential, I think, for them to create uh, the very situations and atmospheres and conditions that they claim uh, that they're most afraid of happening and that they're, and some of them claim is already happening. You know, I mean, how, how long can you continue to suppress and bash and mistreat a race of people or a gender people before those people end up banding together and having an uprising of sorts against that? And then bada bing bada boom you've just created the thing that you claim you're so afraid of i mean if you're afraid of a a, a, a white nationalist uprising or you know a, a, an uprising of white men well then maybe you want to stop ostracizing and berating and suppressing and uh antagonizing white men because at a certain point white men are going to start looking to each other and been like you had enough you had enough yeah me too let's do something about it well, and the thing is, you can you can somewhat say something like that. There is no white man that can actually say something, a white straight man that can say something like that without being labeled a potential threat or a terror threat right now, right? Well, I, I mean, and that's part of the problem too. Is one of the one of the greatest kind of uh, idiocies of the left is this belief that. If you can silence someone or suppress someone or make or make someone or, or and I, I don't just mean an individual but a group as well, if you can take away their voice or make them disappear, then the problem is suddenly solved somehow, and that's not how life works. Um, if in fact, for a moment, now I'm going to draw a very clear and distinct line here. I'm talking about actual neo Nazis or actual KKK, not white men. Uh, you know, white uh, or uh, neo Nazis. If neo Nazis exist and they have, you know, ex uh, they're trying to express themselves or demonstrate or whatever, and you you show up and you know you show up with baseball bats and chains and clubs and all these things, and the police are told to stand down. So now you've got the neo Nazis, uh, you know, clearly getting the messaging that they're they're not going to be protected by the police there's going to be this violent force against them that's allowed to happen and that no one's going to stop it from happening. Do you think the neo-Nazis are just going to go away? Of course not. They're going to start organizing underground. They're going to, they're going to grow in numbers because people are going to feel like, well, they, I, you know, no one wants to live in an, in anywhere in a country or an environment where they're not allowed to express themselves. They're not allowed to, to live openly and so the left has this sort of ridiculous and kind of deranged notion that if they can just intimidate or threaten people enough into disappearing, the problem is solved. Well, no, you, you, what you're actually going to do is create a much, much, much bigger problem because these people are going to become more angry, more agitated. They're going to start organizing underground. And then all of a sudden one day they're going to go, oh, my God, what happened? Uh, there's this whole movement. Uh, of, of, you know, extremists that are what, like, how did this happen? Well, because you dri drove them underground and you drove them into organization. Now that's an extreme thing, you know, that we're talking about. That's a totally different thing. But I mean, the same thing can happen with completely rational, reasonable, reasonable, um, uh, common sense people 
who, you know, I mean, if you're, if you're targeting people based off of the color of their skin, which is to say white people or, or men who are nice guys who aren't doing anything wrong, who are, you know, just trying to participate in the conversation, be a part of things, but you're telling them that they can't. Well, eventually the same effect is going to happen there too. I mean, it's totally understandable. There is going to come a time where white men say enough is enough and there's going to be some sort of backlash. And I fear that as a gay man, because I'm like, this is why to a certain degree, I'm almost over here trying to kind of virtue signal to, you know, straight white men on the right and say, Hey, when the revolution happens, I was on your side. Don't <laughs> don't, please don't come for me. So, well, let me ask you about this as well, because, you know, you started this movement, the walk away movement, and you, you, you've got a very high profile right now. How has your own community, the gay community, responded to you in expressing your opinion and, and kind of straying from the flock? Well, I mean, the majority of the community is not happy or responding very well. But to be fair, they're, what they're responding to is not, you know, an accurate portrayal of my message. It is the caricature of me and my movement and my message that they're hearing about in the media. So, you know, the media is talking about Walkaway being a hate group. The media is talking about Walkaway being uh, a, a, a right wing extremist group, a far right group, um, uh, a Russian propaganda campaign. So, I mean, that's kind of what I think that they're responding to more than anything because if they actually understood my message and if they actually understood the point of Walkaway in this mission, I'm trying to offer people more freedom, more opportunity, more choice. I'm basically trying to tell minority communities, whether that be racial minorities, religious minorities, LGBT, I'm trying to tell all these various groups, you don't have to be a Democrat based simply off of the color of your skin or these different kind of identify, identity characteristics um, that you have a choice, that times have changed, the world has changed, that... Uh, if you want to be an, um, a libertarian, a, an independent, a, a Republican, if you want to be a Trump supporter, not be a Trump supporter, that's your choice. And that you're welcome. All of these different uh, groups or different political identities are there uh, and available and for the taking for you, regardless of these factors. Now, the group, the tribal mentality and the group think within these different uh, groups are, are telling people, you don't have a choice. You have to be a Democrat. All the other groups hate you. There is no seat at the table for you anywhere else but under uh, the Democratic Party and the ideology of liberalism. So, I mean, that is a, a restraint on freedom. That is a constriction on, you know, people having choice and opportunity. And what I'm doing is actually trying to provide more choice and more opportunity. So I don't understand why that's a controversial message for people who claim to be about, you know, freedom and progress and wanting, you know, to push the boundaries of, of, you know, freedom and tolerance and this and that. That's what I'm actually doing. And they're actually restricting it. It's, uh, it, it's interesting because everybody had this kind of apocalyptic notion when, when President Trump got elected. But if you actually look at what's been done, I mean, the economy's great. Uh, minority employment is, is higher than it's ever been. Uh, he had mm -hmm. the prison reform bill. Uh, and there's so many things going on, so many good things going on, but none of that seems to get played out by the media. And if you bring attention to those things, um, you get called all these other horrible things that, that, that people tend to call Republicans. Is that, is that a big piece of your movement uh, in, 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 as far as what you saw when you started this? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, once for me, my walk away from the left began with the realization that the media that I trusted and had placed my trust in for so long was manipulating me, lying to me, uh, deceiving me and, and uh, fear mongering to, you know, to kind of control my, my thoughts and my feelings and my behavior. And um, and so that was the catalyst for me to walk away. And the realization of that really infuriated me. And that's when I wanted to try to kind of spread this message, particularly to other minorities and say like, look, things are not as bad as they seem. We don't have to be as afraid as we're being told that we have to be by the, by the media. And that, um, 
and that, that there is actually a lot of things going very well and very right in this country, but we don't really get to talk about that that much or that's not acknowledged that much uh, because, you know, the media only wants to continue the scare tactics. And uh, so, yeah, that, I mean, that was definitely a, a huge part of why I did this and what the message, the ongoing message is of Walk Away, which is trying to get more truth out to people as well and uh, to get people to see that uh, let's step out of the, the, the fear bubble that they've created for so many of us and, and you know, that they're constantly kind of keeping us locked into this bubble by saying that if we step outside of it, you know, there's a, a boogeyman outside that's like waiting to get us or something that is the Republican Party or conservatives and that just simply really is not the case anymore in 2019. That's just not where we are anymore. And I've been warmly embraced by the Republican Party and by Trump supporters. Um, every minority that I see that has walked away and made their videos and told their stories has also been embraced. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. And um, I just want people to know that. You don't need to stay stuck and paralyzed in this trap of fear and misinformation that's being perpetuated by the political left. One of the things when you started this movement, I went to your Facebook page and there were so many stories up there. So many people that were just so happy that you had started this and, you know, trans people, straight people, gay people, minorities, people from all walks of life coming on to talk about how happy they were that, that you had put this out. Um, how has that affected you as, as, as the leader of this movement? Well, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, there are times that I, I still wake up almost every day. And my first thought is, am I dreaming this? Did this really happen? You know, or am I, do I need to, you know, go, go, go get my blow dryer and go, because I, I used to work as a hairstylist <laughs> before, <laughs> before I start walk away. And so, um, on an almost daily basis, I have to kind of pinch myself that this is kind of the new reality for me. Um, but I don't, um, I don't dwell on in that space or in those feelings too much because it, there's so much work to do. And what motivates me and drives me so much is this feeling that we haven't reached enough people. There's so much work still left to be done. So I don't really linger in a space of patting myself on the back or being like, I'm awesome or way to go. I'm so proud. You know, it, 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 it touches my heart and it makes me feel very proud. Anytime somebody says that this movement has changed their life, has set them free. Um, but you know, I kind of, I, I take that in and then I, I say, okay, it's time to get back to work. And I just try to keep moving forward and keeping my eyes and my, and my mind on what has yet to be done, not on, all the great things that we've already done and how great we should feel about that. I mean, that's wonderful, but um, we have millions of people that we still have to reach. And that's where I keep my, my focus. Where, where are you focused on reaching them? Is it mostly social media? Are you hitting them through videos on, on YouTube or is it, are you doing events around the country and things like that as well? Every possible means. So we're, we're doing an educational video series that we call The Hard Truth, which is available for people to watch for free on YouTube. Um, we've created about 10 episodes. We've currently released three. Uh, we'll be releasing the fourth one in the next week or two. They're like five minute episodes uh, with a different um, speaker speaking on a different subject in each one. They're kind of cool and edgy. They're educational. Um, uh, so we have that where we're reaching people on the internet. We're also, you know, the testimonials are where we started and that's kind of always been the basis and will always be the basis and heart of what walk away is real people telling real stories about why they're fed up, why they're walking away, why they feel pushed away or isolated and no longer part of the political left or a, a political party that they no longer recognize the Democrat party. Uh, and then we're also doing live events around the country. We're doing um, town hall events uh, for all different types of people, but we kind of specialize a lot of these events for minority communities. We do the walkway black Americans, town hall, Hispanic Americans, LGBT Americans, Jewish Americans. We'll do so many more. And again, we love our straight white people too and men. And so this is certainly a movement that is for 
white people and it's for uh, straight people, but it's, it's for all different types of people. But we recognize that minority groups in particular um, are being marketed to and targeted by the Democrat Party and the liberal media in a way that's very specialized. And um, again, it's, it's that marketing of fear mongering and misinformation. And so we're going into these communities in a very customized way and delivering a counterpoint and a counter message to try to open people's hearts and minds and get them to see what's really going on. So we do these live events, uh, these town halls for minority communities. Uh, we're doing a college campus tour that we call the Walkway Thought Revolution College Campus Tour, which is just what it sounds like. We're trying to get young people, millennials, college students to open their minds and think differently and to recognize a certain sense of indoctrination and, and again, kind of targeted marketing that they're receiving in their cl classrooms that they're probably not even recognizing because it's become second nature to have the curriculum taught to them through this filter of privilege and oppression and, and uh, uh, victimhood. And, you know, that's sort of how everything inf information and, and uh, the lessons are being taught. I think so we're trying to kind of undo a lot of that. And then of course I'm just doing speaking engagements as well for adults, anyone who wants to come and just sort of hear this message, why I walked away, why I think other people should walk away. And, um, and we have a lot more events that we'll be doing in 2020, just unique kind of cool events, including we have a really cool women's event that we're doing on February 6th in Nashville. And um, right now we have um, on the panel, Laura Trump, Judge Janine, Katie Hopkins, um, just a slate of really incredible women with really incredible and powerful messages to kind of fight back against liberal, uh, the, the liberal feminism message that, you know, that women have to be angry and, and, and resentful and angry at men. And, you know, there, there's, there is definitely a way and a space in this country to be a powerful woman and love men mm -hmm. and love femininity. And also love that there's a spectrum of choices for women, that uh, there's just as much um, power and, uh, and admirable, it's just as admirable to choose to raise a family or make a home as it is to be a CEO of an organization. And this is where, you know, feminism has lied to women <laughs> and told women that being a mother is not enough that uh, being a wife or a homemaker is not enough. And so, you know, there are whole generations now of women who have been beating the hell out of themselves to try to feel like they're enough or doing enough. When many of them, I feel like, you know, just dreamed of raising a family. And why isn't that good enough? And if it's not, if you really want to raise a family and be a CEO, great, that's awesome. But, you know, respect that women have a whole variety of choices that they can make and none are better than another. And I don't think that that's a message that women are receiving right now. And so we want to, we just want to counteract a lot of these myths and narratives that liberalism is, is uh, foisted upon people and, and I think led a lot of people down the wrong path. There's so much there. I mean, the, the idea that opportunity is only for a select few is, is not true. There is so much opportunity out there. And if you open your eyes to it, I mean, particularly in this day and age where there's so many opportunities to start businesses, to create movements, to, 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 to get out there. There's so many things that people could be doing if they, if they just get rid of the victim mentality. And, and that's, that's what right. I admire the most about what you're doing is you're telling people this idea of victimhood is actually what's oppressing you. This idea that you are somehow oppressed, that you're a victim, that, that the other side's the enemy, that's what's keeping you unhappy and that's keeping you in the same sorry spot that you're in over and over again. Right, I mean, that's, if you're so worried about oppression, why don't you start by not oppressing yourself or subscribing to a, a pattern of thought or a school of thought which is in specifically and expressly designed to keep you a victim or to keep you oppressed. I mean, that is, your, your greatest enemy is not outside of you. It's right here. Because if you 
wake up every day with this mindset that I can't because external forces are preventing me from dot, dot, dot. Um, well, how do you know? Right. I mean, because I, I would, I'm willing to sit down and listen to someone saying that if they can prove to me that they have tried everything and it, nothing worked because of the bigotry and, um, and, you know, suppression of others towards them. If, it, if you can prove that to me, I, I'm willing to listen to you. But if that is just your attitude, because that's what you've been told your whole life. So you're kind of like, what's the point of even trying? Or every failure that I have isn't my fault. It's someone else's fault because I exist in a system that's rigged against me. Um, well, then the only person who's oppressing you is you. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I know that you just had the chance to meet with President Trump for the first time. How was that experience? I did. No, it was absolutely amazing. It was unplanned. Uh, we ran into each other at a restaurant, almost literally. Uh, he was walking in as I was walking out. And uh, somebody I was with made an introduction. He knew right away and was, his eyes kind of lit up when because we've never met before. And, um, and then what unfolded next was just, uh, I mean, it was just a string of very heartfelt, complimentary, uh, I mean, he really praised Walkaway and, and me and the organization, the work that we're doing, the way that we're reaching people. Um, I told him I would really like the opportunity to sit down and talk with him about it. And he said that we'll do that. Uh, he then went around to other tables at the restaurant and said, do you know this guy? Do you know this guy? What he's doing is tremendous. He's getting people to... He's getting people to walk away from the Democratic Party. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. And um, and uh, and then we kind of exchanged a few jokes. And uh, I mean, he was just so nice and so warm and friendly. Took some pictures together, and um, it was just an incredible experience. Incredible experience. And he said several things to me uh, that made very clear that he knew very well who I am and what I'm doing, and. Um, um, I mean, one of the comments that he made to me that it was just my favorite, one of my favorite things was, um, he's retweeted me several times over the last year. Uh, he's given me, oh my God, a, a great number of retweets. And, you know, I mean, part of me wondered, is that really him or is that maybe, you know, uh, an intern or an aide or you know something like that. But as we're talking, um, one of the first things that he said to me after we exchanged a few things was he leaned in, he said, how do you like those retweets? And I said, I love those retweets. Keep those retweets <laughs> coming, please. And he was just like, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, well, what you're doing is tremendous, you know. Um, anyway, so I was just like, this is, this is amazing. You know, it, it just felt like he was talking to me like, you know, like we knew each other from going way back. And it was really cool. I know we only got a couple of minutes, but I got to ask you, number one, what, what do you think is the biggest thing that people are misunderstanding about the man? Well, I think his heart and his intention. I mean, the liberal media narrative is that this is a, a corrupt, heartless, uh, bad guy who's a racist. He's a bigot. He, he's only looking out the, for the interests of himself and, you know, other uh, white male billionaires and stuff. And this is, um, I think his sons, as well as many other people, have described him as a blue collar billionaire. And that is very much the, the vibe that I have gotten, that I got from him as well, is that this is a, a very real, genuine, authentic man of the people. Um, yes, he happens to be uh, outrageously wealthy, but he, um, first of all, earned a, a great amount of that wealth himself. And he did it, I think, by working with working class people and being with them there at their level and doing the work with them. He knows he may not be working class himself, but he knows what it is to be working class and he cares about these people and he doesn't, his, his care and concern uh, is not along racial lines or gender lines. This is a guy who cares very much about, black people and brown people and LGBT people. The liberal media narrative of, of the racist, bigoted Donald Trump is a bunch of crap. And, um, and I just think that he's a really caring, big-hearted guy 
who has does not need to be doing this. He doesn't need the power, the money, or the prestige of being president. He's doing this because he cares about this country. He cares about the people of this country, and that includes all people. And uh, and I think he's doing a tremendous, outstanding job. And it's it's disgraceful the way that he's being treated by the left, by the Democrats, by the liberal media. And you know he's taking this on the chin day after day after day for you, for me, and for all people in this country. And we should be eternally grateful that we have a president who cares as much about us as he does and is working so hard and getting treated so badly for you and for me. Final question here. And, and this goes back to our audience. Um, like I mm -hmm. said, I've got a, a whole audience here of U U.S. military combat veterans who are heading off into the university campuses. Uh, they're facing a place that is openly, at times, openly hostile to the very values they once stood for. And they are looking toward a, a, a four year period where it, things might get very awkward for them. What is your advice uh, for these young men and women as they head off to that new life? Well, number one, uh, know that you're not alone, although sometimes it may feel like it because right now the accepted norm is this standard that liberals have uh, carte blanche to say what they want, whenever they want, to whomever they want, whenever they feel like it, and that no one, there will be no ret retribution for anything that they say, and that anyone more centrist or conservatively minded does not have that same privilege as liberals do. So it becomes very easy sometimes to feel like you're alone that no one else feels the way that you feel. One of the things I'm trying to do with walk away, and I say this all the time, it's time for the silent majority to become unsilent. We all need to speak up. We all need to band together. We need to support one another. We need to use our voices and, and stand up proudly for what we believe in. And the more of us that do that, and the more of us that support each other as we do that, the more we will re reclaim the power of what is the acceptable norm of what can and cannot be expressed in the public square. And so um, please know that, you know, if you stand up and you use your voice and you push back against the accepted norm, you will be speaking not only on behalf of yourself, but thousands if not millions of people from coast to coast who feel exactly the same way that you feel uh, that, what seems like common sense to you is common sense. And don't ever forget that just because you end up maybe in an environment where you're surrounded by extremists on the left who have that microphone and you begin to feel like, you know, am I the crazy one? Is what I believe crazy? No. If it feels common sense to you, it probably is common sense. But common sense people have given up their power to the extremist left. So don't be afraid. To stand up for yourself, be afraid to, uh, to stand up for what you believe in. Know that when you do, you're setting a lot of other people free. And you can, you always have a home in the walkaway campaign, walkawaycampaign.com. And uh, you can make your testimonials and tell your stories, and you'll be connected with a community of hundreds of thousands of people who, just like you, are sick and tired of being bullied and pushed away by the liberal left, who want to come together and, and stand together and take that that power back and that voice back become a part of our community and reach out to me and let me know if you want me to come to your school and your university and bring my movement there. I'm happy to come and speak up and provide a platform uh, in those areas where maybe you're feeling overwhelmed or undervalued or underrepresented. Walk away campaign will come. We'll stand up for you and, um, and we'll provide that platform. So just know that you're not alone. Outstanding. Finally, I, I just want to acknowledge you. I know that starting something like this, number one, could not have been easy for you, um, given where you came from, given your background, uh, given the fact that it took probably questioning everything you thought you believed in. And I think that that is the essence of who we need to be as a republic in understanding that it's not about political party. It's about what's right or wrong. And when you see wrong out there, you need to stand up and you need to say, hey, that's wrong. 
And it, it, it takes people like you to be able to do that. And it takes people like you to be able to keep the health of this Republic healthy. So thank you, Brandon, for everything you're doing out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thanks so much for having me on your show and uh, giving me this platform to be able to talk to your audience, uh, particularly so many people in the veteran community. Uh, let me tell you right now that um, I am so grateful for the service that you provided to our country. I say that to both you and to your audience. And um, thank you so much for fighting for our freedom, for giving us the freedom that we have. And, and thank you for sacrificing yourselves the way that you have for the freedom of this country. And I say that on behalf of myself and everybody in the Walk Away campaign. So thank you all so much. Absolutely. Brendan, thank you so much. And to everybody out there, definitely check this movement out. Uh, like I said, there's, there's a whole lot of really great people who are telling their stories on his Facebook page. Uh, Brandon is putting great stuff out there on Twitter all the time. There are some great educational videos that Brandon mentioned, and we will get those up on the show notes for this episode. I want to wish everybody out there a great start to the holiday season. And, you know, like we always say, get out there and live, live your best lives while you can. And we'll be back at you later on this week with some more awesome content.